ready. Okay. I'm 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 gonna say that it is time to move in to our next guests. We've got we have got the kinky makers here, which means we have James, Craig, Alex, and Kyle. Hello. Um there's a guy who loves a shirt. Alex, known for his crops. <laughs> you could get you could get an Oshawa tea and just crop you that. You could baby. crop it, yeah. Oh yeah. Do you guys have any crops? We don't, but you can. But you're a maker. Have, you're allowed to. Have I would like to crop release away. an official open source uh, cropping tool. <laughs> I think those are called scissors, <laughs> and I'm not sure if we ever closed the source on those. <laughs> I think technically scissors would be considered open source. Yeah, I. We can laser engrave you some scissors that say open source. Yeah, are scissors open source? I'd like to ask the panel. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll look into it while you guys take it away. <laughs> you got to add them to the registry. You got to get it certified. Yeah, yeah we got to get that certified. <laughs> Hey, so. uh, I guess I will start with the intro. Uh, I'm James uh, with the Kinky Makers. Uh, to my right, I guess on screen that oh uh, that way is Kyle, and then below us is Alex. Uh, we've been around uh, for a bit um, promoting open source sex tech. Our biggest project is oh again I'm getting confused as to where I am behind me over here is the awesome which is the open source sex machine uh that we've been uh, developing for the last uh I don't know about four years somewhere thereabouts just just around the beginning of the pandemic um and uh we have a online discord community where it is developed talked about and uh iterated on uh, Alex has a company of his own, uh, Research and Desire, who helps support uh, both Kinky Makers and the open source uh, sex machine. Uh, and uh, Kyle is one of the uh, original uh, creators of the awesome as well, along with the rest of us. Hey, uh, what are the, what are some of the, do you know the latest stats on uh, the Discord server? That's uh, pretty impressive. Oh, there's uh, like 7,000 or so people in there, but. Discord numbers or have people coming and going, so a, a fairly fairly uh, 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 well trafficked uh, Discord, uh, specifically talking about the uh, the awesome and other uh, open source sex ideas. Um, yeah, uh, I didn't really prepare anything. I guess we should have uh, maybe talked no, a little bit more about this. But we could. Uh, I was thinking maybe we talk a little bit about um, why open source has been beneficial for the awesome, right? I think for the most part that uh, that has been the open discussion and the enthusiasm. Uh, I don't want to speak for the three of us, but I think this project would have died at the first iteration. Once it sort of worked, we would have said that's good enough. I think the the great part about open hardware and putting it online and discussing with people and joining organizations like this is the discussion and enthusiasm helps get you through the the bad parts of a project, right? Or at least shows an interest. Yeah, and I think um, the barrier to entry is much lower, right? And so to your point, like if you want to make, I, I think I think your question a little bit, Jim, is like why make an open source project instead of a uh, private project or, or how does it benefit like how does it benefit the project being open yeah yeah and, and i definitely agree i think for myself uh like it's cool to make small projects but um i think the value of the project for me is really like getting to see other people use the thing like i want to make something for some person right uh, in some cases that's myself but like very rarely i think is like a project just for you it's often like for you and to do something with other people and so there's this social aspect of getting to see that. And I think the coolest part about open source in in my experience of the awesome has been like, you put this thing out there and then people are like, hey, I, I did this thing and I thought it was cool or I thought it sucked for this reason. And would you consider fixing it like this? Um, and that's super rewarding, right? You have to like see the results of your work in like an order of magnitude. I think in some ways company, working for a company does something similar. We have to like see your work at a larger scale so instead of just making one awesome for myself, which would be fun, um, we get to have a thousand people out in the wild get the benefits of, of having an awesome. And then the, you get this like cool community building effect. Um, 
that I think is very unique. And in the sense that a lot of people are like contributing or, or feel invested in like the project success. And so you get to build with like a community, whereas otherwise the project is solo and totally to your point, I think you run out of energy much faster on a project you're working on by yourself. As soon as like the, the shininess has worn off, it's hard to see it to the end. Yeah, and I think actually one of the points you raised there was like, um, once you start sharing it, it is like required to make it buildable by other people. So mm -hmm. not just on your printer or not just with your hardware or that one-off janky two by four you use to support it. Like yeah. you start thinking about making it as a complete uh, package, right? Yeah, and I think that's maybe one of the reasons that sometimes those projects end up having paths to commercial projects or like a, a waste fund because you do start building like a, you're required to build a, a more robust version of the thing. Anytime you build one thing that just has to exist on a bench top, uh, it's like a different order of magnitude than building something that a uh, hundred different people will use in a hundred different ways for a hundred times as long. And uh, and that's that's problems that uh, commercial products have to solve. And I think it's the same with the open source where you have to address these things that like make it robust and reliable and easy to use for a variety of use cases, a variety of people in different places. Um, and before we get too panelly on all the, the cool open source things, uh, I think also open source sex tech uh, and what, why why are we here specifically? I think, you know, as we have an open source sex machine um, and support this community of people who are sharing projects around um, in like the sexual space is, uh, is that I think there's this really cool effect that happens when you have when you introduce technical um, details or technical problems into a space, which is like really activates this like rational thinking part of your brain. And so I, I think for most people, if you walked up and be like, hey, like, tell me about how you have penetrative sex. They'd be like, excuse me, like that is a very personal question, <laughs> right? I don't feel comfortable talking to you stranger about this topic. But suddenly when you're like, hey, I have this, uh, this belt driven motor application and i'm trying to figure out like the torque requirements for this brushless motor as it fits with like this pulley on this belt we have these moment loading issues with the bearing and like in order to figure this out we're trying to figure out like how much force does it take to penetrate various orifices so, like what an interesting problem like have you yeah. considered that right like suddenly you're in a different framework that's much less like about you and it's it's more like feels like it's about like you're working together through this thing and i think it lets you have these really cool conversations um, and like, it feels like it reduces the risk and the personal stake where you get to have. And, and I love, I love that. It's like so cool to be solving these like technical challenges where like, ah, if only we had more anal penetration data, right? Like then we could really optimize the actuator design. <laughs> then we could know more about the thermal loading of this motor. <laughs> and we are, we are getting that data indirectly, but we aren't collecting it currently. We're not even, we don't even have a place for people to opt in, which is something we've talked about doing for a while. Right. Yeah. And I think that's another cool thing about open source is you get um, a, a wide reach of people who are like interested in contributing to something. And I think sexuality especially is often under researched um, because it's difficult to get funding in that space. And we've talked about this a lot, James and Kyle, like getting data sets in that space. Right. Like how do we how do we let people share um, consensually? data around sexuality in a way that's like easy to do right it's hard to collect a hundred people to come in and collect force measurements during penetration that is a hard problem but yeah any not like only that but... flag is very easy <laughs> yeah like not only that but then security issues you know we all know about uh, iot and how it's a really hard problem to solve when it comes to privacy and security and then you throw in an extra element a curveball of you know uh dealing with our bodies and uh, it's, it's very yeah, personal so seeming right. data but it would really just be simple right yeah but yeah 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 yeah, okay. I haven't yeah. that code yet. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a cool opportunity to, uh, yeah, to like be able to build information about these things that are not not well discussed, and also provide a forum for people to discuss them that feels safe, um, and in a way that is a little bit depersonalized in the sense that you don't have to open the conversation with like, 
am I doing the same thing that you're doing? Because I don't like something is wrong. Even like, hey, like my my awesome breaks when I do this, <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> Making it an engineering question, not a personal details question. Exactly, right? exactly. I think it really facilitates these conversations. And I think these conversations are not had as much as could be healthy for people. Um, and so it really builds to this sense of like taboo and like um, inability to learn about your own body and how other people are having experiences. Well, I think right. so often you kind of come across people who are telling you stories like, you they people didn't know that everyone was having this experience they were having right? or it was a common experience or like that there's someone has or that some... it was possible maybe maybe not most normal but like it other people are experiencing the same thing right exactly. we aren't having those conversations and it is a detriment to, to people in their sexuality right totally agree and so i think it's just like a really cool way to facilitate those conversations in like a low uh, a safe safe and like lower pressure way and it's so fun. We went to the first open source hardware summit in New York City two years ago now. Yep. And uh, very not sure. We were the only um, sexual wellness adjacent uh, project. So it's very unclear how the response would be. But I think, and we've talked about this, about this James, we brought the awesome a lot of places. And uh, I think the awesome is actually most engaging. Oh, Lucian's after us. Oh, wait, this is a comment. Glad to see you on the stream, Allison James. Hey. Lucian, I love you. <laughs> I, I got to message you because I, I want to chat. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I'll let, I don't know if, is Lucian doing a, a talk later? Is is that a thing? I don't know. If they are, ask Check them it out. Their, yeah. their thoughts on awesome. I won't, I won't uh, speak for other people. Um, but, but I, I think uh, you're I talking about wanted... how our reception at the first open source, right? Yeah, Maybe yeah, yeah. Um, was so cool and so much better than any sex adjacent place we've been um, with the awesome, which I think it speaks to the fact that like the technicality of the project like makes it uh, engaging and like kind of safe to discuss. And so we end up having so many cool conversations with people that are tech first, but then inevitably like discuss a lot of the components of you know the application and sexuality um but in ways that like you could you would never have those conversations with people directly about their sexuality right no and, and like you said even in sex positive uh environments where we have brought this like the conversation has been very muted and hush it's not it seems too taboo mm -hmm. coming to the open source hardware i think we really found our people not in that maybe they want to use it or anything but i think a lot of people are very interested in it interested in solving the problems Mm -hmm. And we've gotten people contributing to solving the problems as well, right? Totally. Yeah, yeah. Love love the amount of problem solving that happens in open source hardware. Uh, it, really it, my language. As, a, as a show and tell, uh, do you think uh, I, I'm stuck in a coffee shop? Uh, but if you guys want to kind of maybe Ooh, yeah, show yeah. some of the hardware or even the space that you're working in, that'd be really cool mm -hmm. what you're working on. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, I, I guess we kind of uh, assumed that uh, everybody knew what this was, or we just talked about it and uh, and moved on. But uh, so this is the uh, open source sex machine. Um, it is a uh, stroking machine uh, with a linear rail and a servo that drives it. Uh, it also has a uh, remote. Now, the interesting thing about using servos is that you have uh, independent speed and stroke control. Often in the um, in the, the let's call it the lower end of the sex machine market, you wouldn't have stroke control. You would just have speed. So this is really a, a full functioning machine uh, that is fairly reasonably cost sub sub one thousand dollars. I don't want to give an actual price on it because it depends on how you build it. But like around what? Alex, four or five hundred dollars US, somewhere like that. If you build your own, probably slightly less than that. Yeah, but what's order, what's a ready to play minus. version from R and D? I think if you buy a fully assembled one, it's six thirty. Okay, so still about half the cost of something that could do this kind of uh, function, right? Yeah, yeah and and it, it, one of the original goals of the project was to make like a more human, more human machine, if if we can say that. Uh, yeah. but I think, um, sex machines kind of look like aggressive industrial robots a lot of the time. 
uh, and things you don't really want near your body. And so one of the original goals of the project, I mean, the project was originally um, just like it was pandemic times and a partner was like, why don't, why don't we have a sex machine? I'm like, that's a really good question. Why don't we? I'm like, I think there's enough components in the apartment to like to build one, right? And uh, with the advent of popularized 3D printing components and just compact robotics in general, it really felt like the ability to produce a high performance um, machine has like really changed in the last 10 to 15 years. And the design um, of these machines on average, like commercial products has not changed in the last 30 to 40 years, you know? Yeah, and uh, to that point, I think we uh, should have mentioned, we also occasionally uh, are trying to pick it back up doing teardown of sex toys, right? Mm -hmm. And on this past weekend, we took a part of Sibian, which was designed in the 80s and internally still looks like it was designed in the 80s, yeah, right? Yeah, very clearly designed in, the, in 1984. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so taking some modern, uh, consumer hobbyist materials and trying to make a new machine, I think was one of the goals of the, the awesome, right? Yeah, this was, I, I found a couple of uh, old awesome parts. Oh, nice. This was V1 of the awesome, which used a open loop NEMA 17 stepper motor. Like in, I was trying, the original goal was the entire bomb on Amazon. So like everything next day, Amazon prime, um, and lowest cost very low cost, but still have high performing. Um, with this little tiny mount for the rail, uh, we use the kind of, also the standard um, like MGN 12, do I have some rail bearing? Uh, rail that was also popularized through 3D printers, um, the high wind knockoffs. Based, so this is what mounts um, in here and originally a smaller carriage size. Uh, very quickly people in the project were like, hey, we don't care about price, <laughs> uh, we want performance. And so I think the bomb cost for this, which had like an open loop stepper, a $20 stepper driver or something was like a hundred dollars, you know, for everything. We also um, didn't have a custom PCB at the time, which I think is a whole journey for us, right? We've kind of yeah. taught ourselves now how to do PCB design, starting with hiring it out and, oh yeah, there's a V1 of the very, uh, the very V1 ambitious. Board that uh, again, we were too scared to put real components on. So everything was like daughter board through holes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this was using like an off the shelf, like ESP drops in here. And then this is like a off the shelf stepper board drops in here. Um, I, I think that might've been the second board I ever laid out first yeah. or second. Yeah, it's it's not, it shows, yeah. <laughs> yeah, also um, went through a, a sort of history of um, different servo motors. These are the motors that you pull out of a massage gun, which interestingly are actually all brushless outrunners. Um, and they're so close to being perfect for our application um, with the exception that they're just not very easy to control, but they're close to the right power and torque range. And these are like $6, like they're producing right. such volume um, that they are near zero cost. So one day we'll get like a nice, a nice brushless outrunner. But they probably need $40 worth motors. of outboard gear to make them work, right? Yeah, they're pretty fast. They're generally geared quite high, um, electric, like electrically wound. To I'm just saying, like, uh, like elect, you need a, a, a custom control board to bring it into closed loop, right? And then you would need all the other stuff. It probably, mm. I think every time we've looked at this, the servo that we are using now, you can't build anything cheaper. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that would be the only thing. Like, if you could get a custom rev of that board, like there's a little control board on there, and they are kind of closed loop, right? Um, in the sense that they are commutating the brushless motor, so they do know where it is and how to apply the the field windings. Uh, do you have a glow lighter to hold up for everybody to see what the the closed loop servo we're using? Uh, yes, I have uh, many motors, um, but this is. This is the sort of latest and greatest. Uh, this is the slightly smaller stack size, um, but these are the 57 aim 30 and 15s, but uh, nice little one Newton meter, 1500 RPM brushless motor, closed loop, uh, takes step direction and RS-45. Would strongly recommend these for almost any project and they're like 80 US dollars, 90 US dollars um, from China. And they've performed very nicely. This is also the internal sort of like, mechanical routing, um, which is what also kind of kicked off the project. I think a lot of people 
<laughs> this method of having a compact actuator where the stat the belt is fixed and the rail moves, which allows the body to be very small. So if you had like a, a fixed like continuous belt loop, um, your body has to be the length of the stroke. And here you can have an arbitrarily long stroke. So you could have like a very long rail um, and this body size would stay the same. You would just have a longer fixed belt, um, which was I think like the novel mechanical element that made it kind of cool at the beginning and small and compact. Um, there are even more compact versions. I have one around somewhere of the awesome body now. I think we're kind of at the point where we can start optimizing that type of thing. Yeah. Um, and some really cool mounting options. The I don't have. Yeah, the, the new round op mounting option. I haven't personally printed it, but it looks awesome. It's so good. I printed a couple of them. Can confirm, very awesome. Um, yeah, I think I think I really I really appreciated the uh, the evolution of the mounting options. I think that was very very much community driven. Yeah, like a lot of people on the Discord server posting, you know, proud setups of their of their base configurations and how they've mounted it because i don't think we that was like something we hadn't really figured out totally that we discussed a lot about but we never really kind of were like yes this is what the base is going to be like you know so it was really open-ended for a lot of community driven solutions yeah exciting. i think it was easy to optimize the actuator body of the actual robotics component um because that's generally doesn't change based on how it gets used, but the mounting really might change a lot depending on your use case. So some people might want a very small mount mounted to a rigid object, or some people might need like a long reaching arm to clear some other object or standing, sitting, lying down. And so that was definitely a harder design problem. Um, the, the kind of place that it settled, also uh, we made this super light, compact, efficient actuator, but then it turns out you do need some like mechanical force to push against, right? There's a reactive like force. A big stand or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you do need, if if not mass, rigidity, right? Um, so a lot of the stands used the, like, didn't design out the weight and size because to some extent, somewhere, you need something to hold this thing in place. Um, I think we've kind of settled on a, a really cool spot now with Awesome where it's moving to a pivot body that's very modular and can just bolt onto anything. And so, yes, we have an extrusion base standard um, like, like this guy here. So this is sort of like if you want an awesome on the floor, you can use this extrusion. Um, but you can also mount like that rotating pivot section just to like a piece of plywood or a, a desk or a table or a little beam coming out of something else. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we just need to make like modular stuff that people can like we we I think the mounting is like a really cool part to DIY totally yourself. Whereas like a complex mechatronic actuator is like a lot of work to fully DIY from ground up. Um, I, I think that um, there was a talk earlier about medical devices and how if you can solve this one specific thing, then the next person doesn't have to solve that one mm -hmm. specific part and they can build upon it, right? Totally. Yeah. I think that that has really happened with the awesome, right? I think the base and everything got popular and standardized as one shape, but then a lot of people have come up with different mounting options. Uh, I will say mostly I've been on the record for a while saying I don't think there is one solution. Uh, Alex's 80-20 uh, stand here, I think, is pretty close to the solution. Um, but um, Armpit's uh, Roto Lock, which uh, has looks like it might be the future of the body shape, I um, I think is pretty interesting. And uh, actually to that point, like we were talking a little bit earlier about community. I think uh, we have all had some trouble uh, actually being engaged with the community and fostering it. And I think we've taken some steps or uh, Alex specifically with his uh, company uh, has been able to hire somebody to kind of a little bit of community management and uh, interaction, right? So when, just to interrupt you guys, just because we're running a little bit over and we've got a little How bit of a lineup. How much time do we there. have, by the way? Uh, just right that? until now. Oh, okay, oh, perfect. Until, okay. until right now. <laughs> I know you were for like an hour or 10 minutes. <laughs> no, yeah. it's, it's a 20 minute time slot. Oh, okay, um, perfect. So uh, yeah, I mean, one thing that I think is really fun about uh, about your community is that there are people who have businesses and there are people who are iterating for their own purposes. And there's like a lot of people kind of concentrated around this 
like open source project, which is really, really fun. And like really like seeing that open source philosophy um, at play. So if people want to be more involved, uh, you mentioned the Discord server, um, you know, like how, where can people find you online? Um, how can we? Uh, uh, awesome.tech, OSSM.tech will get you all of the links. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then uh, Research and Desire as well will get you to uh, see what parts you can buy. Um, we do have a custom PCB for building this to make it easy. Uh, you can build it on your own. You can rev your own. All, all, all the files are up there, right? So it is fully open source, but we do support people's builds by making it commercially available, the parts, right? Amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, this project is really fun and um, it's been great to get to know you guys better through the last few years of the summit and uh, looking forward to seeing you folks in Edinburgh. Thanks, thanks so much. Bye. All right. Thanks. Thank you.